Welcome back, America. Hugh Hewitt live in Studio West. So pleased to welcome former UN ambassador and former governor of South Carolina, Nikki Haley, back to the program for her first interview after declaring for the presidency. Miss Madam Ambassador, welcome. Good morning. Good morning, Hugh. It's great to be with you again. Thank you. Now, since we cover all of New Hampshire, the Granite State is 100% covered by this conversation. Most of Iowa, a lot of South Carolina, and almost all of Florida. I hope you'll keep coming back. Absolutely. All right. The um, first question is the Roger Roger Mudd's famous question. Why do you want to be president? I don't want to wait on anyone else to fix it. I look at where we are in the country, and I see that we're $31 trillion in debt, and we're spending like drunken sailors, and we need to put Washington, D.C. on a diet. I see our kids have fallen so far back in education, we don't know how we're going to catch them back up, and we've got to focus on that next generation. I see the fact that we've got crime in our streets, we've got open borders, that our minds are being closed from woke ideology, and I see a foreign policy that's in shambles. And, you know, I was a two-term governor who took a failed double unemployment, double-digit unemployment state, and I turned it into an economic powerhouse. And I was an ambassador at the UN that didn't deal with one country. I dealt with 192, and I took the kick me sign off of our backs. And I want to get America to a place where she's strong and proud again. And I want to do that for our kids. So I, I, I reframe it again like Roger Mudd did. You have the issue set down, and we'll talk about each of them. But why does Nikki Haley want to be the president? Because I know I can fix it. I know I can get this done. I've, I have always been a problem solver. And I know that when my parents came to this country over 50 years ago, they came to a country that was strong and confident and full of opportunities. And I look at the national self-loathing that is happening now. And I look at this creep into socialism that's happening now. And I see that our kids are getting further and further away from the patriotic reasons to love our country. We can't be this way. Over 50% of parents in this country think that their kids won't have the same life or better than they had. That's a very sad state of affairs. And, you know, I have two children. I have one, a daughter that's getting married, and I see how hard it is for her and her fiancé to try and buy a home. I have a son that's a junior in college, and I see that he's writing papers that he doesn't believe in just to get an A. And that's not okay. I'm not going to leave that country for my kids. I want us to get back to where our children love America again. And I'm going to fight to make that happen. Now, Ambassador Haley, a lot of people are going to run. What is your unique appeal, your vision that is different from, say, former President Trump, Governor DeSantis, former Secretary of State Pompeo? Lots of people are running. Chris Sununu, Mike Pence, uh, maybe your fellow South Carolinian, Tim Scott. What is unique about the Haley appeal? Well, I think look at my record. I mean, I have been a chief executive. I've been a governor. I've run a state. I've had to deal with crises. I've had to balance a budget. I've had to manage a National Guard. I've had to work with hurricanes and floods. And I reformed education, passed voter ID, and passed an Arizona style e immigration law. Um, I took 20,000 people from welfare and put them to work and created reforms in our prison system that gave us the lowest recidivism rate in the country. I, when I went to the UN, I dealt with thugs and dictators every day. We passed the largest sanctions against any country in a generation in North Korea. We helped get out of the Iran deal. We pushed for the embassy to be moved from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. But more than that, we made sure we had the backs of our allies and we held our enemies to account and we made America strong again. I've got the executive experience. I've got the foreign policy experience and I've got a love for a country that I am determined to get back on her feet again. I bet in a multi-party candidate race, it's all about differentiation. How are you going to differentiate from President Trump, Ron DeSantis, Mike Pump, all, all of the people running, Mike Pence? How, how, what's different? Well, find any... None of them have the experience that I have in terms of what I've led and how I've done it in terms of state experience and foreign policy. But more than that, you know, I've been to Iowa and I've been to New Hampshire. And what I saw is people want options. They don't want just Biden and Trump. And you're talking about a bunch of people who haven't even put their pants on to get in the race yet. I'm talking about the people who are in the race. And what I know is 
that people want options. They don't think you have to be 80 years old to be in Washington, D.C. They do agree with me that we need to have term limits in D.C. and clean it up. They do agree with me that we need to have mental competency tests for people over the age of 75. They do agree with me that we have to start balancing a budget. They do agree with me that we have to stop giving foreign aid to countries that hate America. And, you know, we had... Thousands of people show up at our announcement in South Carolina. We had hundreds of people standing room only and overflow crowds in New Hampshire and Iowa. And it's because they want to know what their options are and they want to move past the drama and get to solutions and do something different. Now, Ambassador, I've always appreciated you've been easy to reach. You've been easy to book. As you run for president, it's very important to engage, not just with the Hugh Hewitt show, obviously, or Fox News, but everybody, people like the Ruthless Podcast, places that throw you hard and fast, high balls, fastballs at your head and curveballs that are out of reach. Are you going to go everywhere and talk to everyone? I'm doing the Ruthless Podcast today. Are you really? They're my pals. That's great. I have been in Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina. I'm going back to Iowa again next week. We've been all over this country. We're doing CPAC tomorrow. We're doing Club for Growth on Saturday. I mean, I am anywhere and everywhere. You can't outwork me. And I think this is about earning the people's respect across this country and letting them know I am determined to make them proud in the way that we run this race. They deserve it. Americans deserve a better life than what they have right now. They Let's deserve go to- it. Their children deserve it. And we need to get them there. Let's go to national security, Madam Ambassador. First, I believe that China, Russia, and Iran are a new axis of evil with Beijing as the senior partner and running the deal. What is your view of those three countries being an alliance and a de facto axis of evil? It is absolutely the case. China and Russia made it clear to the world when they said they were unlimited partners. Iran is their junior partner. And if you look at what's happening right now from Russia getting drones from Iran or missiles from North Korea to China now starting to make moves the way that they are, I mean, this is a serious alliance that we have to start really taking seriously. And that doesn't mean we react to them. That means we let them know what we expect of them. And I can tell you, we need to start with telling them that we don't want Americans looking to the sky and seeing a Chinese spy balloon looking back at us. So when you look at the front in Ukraine, and Russia has lost another major tank battle, the New York Times reports this morning, is that actually part of the the Axis's front? Should Americans understand the war in Ukraine is just being an extension of the Chinese lurch for hegemony? Americans need to understand that the war in Ukraine is bigger than Ukraine. It's about a war for freedom, and it's one that we have to win. Because, first of all, the Ukrainians have done a phenomenal job in really trying to gain their territories back. I mean, you know by the fact that, you know, Russia has literally half a million people have left Russia. They've lost thousands of soldiers. Um, You know, they're getting desperate when they're getting things from Iran and North Korea. They've raised the draft age to 65. Putin knows he's in you know, getting into a place where he doesn't know how to get out. But the biggest part of it is, if Ukraine wins, it sends a message to China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea not to go there. You know, Russia has been very clear with us. We need to believe dictators when they say something. They said that Poland and the Baltics are next. We don't want a world war. Winning in Ukraine prevents further war. Losing in Ukraine means there will be more aggression by our dictators and less freedom around the world. Ambassador Haley, there's been some differentiation among the Republican candidates, both declared and and imminent, on weapons for Ukraine. Governor DeSantis has warned against a blank check. Former President Trump has denounced warmongers. Uh, Mike Pompeo and Tom Cotton are sort of on the other end. Send everything they need to win right now. Where's Ambassador Haley on that spectrum of Republican support for the people of Ukraine and, and President Zelensky? Don't send money. Don't send troops. Send all the equipment and ammunition they need with our allies and make sure that they have everything they need to win. We can do it by way of equipment and and ammunition and working with our allies. We don't have to do it with checks and troops. Would you send F-16s and A-10s? Yes, everything they need to win. All right. you know, uh, Iran is close to breakout. They're at 86 percent of what they need to have a nuclear weapon. Would you support U.S. acting with or without Israel against Iran to s- destroy that program? Well, I think we need to work with Israel. Israel's already on to it. Israel's already looking to move in that direction. I think we need to work with them. But we also need to work with our Arab allies. Saudi Arabia very much doesn't want Iran to get the 
the bomb either. We need to work with them, the Emiratis, the Qataris. We've got to make sure we work with more countries to stop Iran, and we have to call out China for helping them. That's but they're le- the Madam Ambassador, they're less than a month away. They can, they can have a nuclear weapon within a month. If you were president, would you have already ordered a military strike on Iran to destroy that capacity? If I was president, I would be having a meeting right now with Israel and the Arab countries saying, what are we going to do to stop it? This isn't just our fight alone. This is all of their fights. They are a destruction to all terrorism. Is they, they are the number one state sponsor of terrorism. And we have to make sure we do everything to stop them. You don't just quickly say, oh, we're going to go to war. What you do is you get with your allies and see what that force is going to look like. And you get strategic in how you're going to do it. You know, the Arab countries... Saudi Arabia just gave $400 million to Ukraine. Don't think they don't have their eye on Iran closer or as much as Israel does. We need to make sure we get them together and say, what is our game plan? And then go forward. If no one would support you, would you act unilaterally to uh, destroy the Iranian ability to produce nuclear weapons? I would do everything I could to stop Iran, but I'm not going to say what we're going to do. And I think that's the problem is we don't need to tell our enemies what we're going to do. We need to work closely with our allies to make sure we have a good long-term vision to make sure we are preventing war. Let's go to the triad, Madam Ambassador. I don't think we can afford the same kind of one-third, one-third, one-third that we've done. What is the most important leg of the triad and why? Well, they're all important. Land, air, and sea matter, but you also have to add cyber and artificial intelligence to those. It's going to be very much a different kind of war. And cyber and artificial intelligence affect land, air, and sea now like it never has before. We need to be pushing on all cylinders. We need to create a strong military. We need to make sure we're modernizing our military. And we need to make sure we're at the top of our game. China is doing that right now. And we have to make sure that we can... We can compete with that. They have the largest naval fleet in the world. They have more air defense systems than we do. We have not focused our military where it needs to be. Instead, you can ask my husband, the wife of the combat, they're doing gender pronoun classes. That's not where America needs to be. It needs to be having the strongest military in the world. There's nothing that scares the Russians, the Chinese, or the Iranians more than a strong military. A strong military doesn't start wars. A strong military prevents wars. You know, W told me once in an interview that whenever anything gets to the president, it's only the controversial stuff and it's always the tough choices. Can anything that, that can be avoided doesn't get to him or her. The fact is funding has, cannot continue one third, one third, one third for land, sea and air. Everything matters. Cyber matters. AI matters. But but the Columbia class, the updating of the Minutemen, the B-21, they compete for scarce resources. What's your priority among them? I think when you look at the Department of Defense, understand there's a lot of waste there, too. There's a lot of bureaucracy and red tape. We've got to cut all that out. We've got to start modernizing by way of making sure that more money is going to what it takes to prevent war and what we'll do to protect our national security. And so there are a lot of contracts that are slow. They reward um, certain companies and don't open it up to all companies. And we need to make sure that we have the top innovation, the best equipped, the strongest military, so that we can be at the top of our game. And that means jumping into Department of Defense, looking at their procurement programs, and figure out how we're going to move forward. But, Madam Ambassador, I know you know this. There isn't enough waste, fraud, and abuse in the Department of Defense to fund the Department of Defense. There are certainly things that can be done. I'm going to circle back, third time to land the plane here. Do you have in your mind a clear priority as to where the next dollar gets spent in modernization of the triad? I think you strengthen our military with innovation. We have to be at the top of our game on innovation. We can't have old submarines. We can't have old airplanes. We can't have missiles that aren't as compared, ready to compete with Iran and China. We need to modernize everything we're doing to make sure it's at the top of our game. You don't look at just land or air or sea. You have to do it all. You have to make sure where are we Where are we slacking? Where do we have top game? And what do we need to improve? And you work with innovators to make sure we do that. We've got to be smart and strategic again, not picking one or the other. We should be able to balance all of them at the same time. And if that means putting more money towards it, you do that. You do whatever it means to be strong in terms of our military and make sure other countries know we're not backing off. We're about 3% GDP on defense budget right now, Madam Ambassador. Where should we be if we're serious about surviving as a free and independent republic leader of the West? We need to look and ask 
our military, where do we stand if there was a war today? Where do we stand on all of those issues? And how do we get up to speed so that we could win that war? And then spend whatever it takes. And then you spend whatever it takes to make sure that we are ready. National security of Americans is the most important thing we should ever do. And making sure that we have the ability to protect Americans, no matter what, is of utmost importance. Now, let me turn to some politics, uh, Madam Ambassador. Uh, And this one is a difficult one. Uh, Does South Carolina matter less since you and and Tim Scott may be in the race? Does New Hampshire matter less because Chris Sununu is going to be in the race? Does Iowa just win it all because Florida is going to have the former president, the current governor in the race? It sort of scrambled the early, uh, you know, tickets out of Iowa, tickets out of New Hampshire, tickets out of South Carolina when you've got um, homegrown uh, candidates, doesn't it? No, I think I totally disagree. I mean, in order, um, I'm incredibly popular in South Carolina, but if I don't do well in Iowa or New Hampshire, that's not going to matter. You can't just win Iowa and think that you're going to get South Carolina. It doesn't work like that. These states are very different, and they want you to come back over and over again. They want to shake hands with you over and over again, and they want you to get coffee breath close asking the hard questions, being able to answer them. And, you know, I think I, coming from South Carolina, you've got good, hardworking people that know how hard it is to buy groceries for families. They know how tough it is to make sure their kids are getting a good education. They want safe streets. They want a strong America. And they're going to ask you how you're going to do it. And, you know, when I went to Iowa, I appreciated you know, their agriculture concerns are the same concerns that we had in South Carolina when it came to agriculture. But, you know, this is also a state that's strong and proud, and they want to see a country that's strong and proud. You look at New Hampshire, and they have, you know, so many veterans, and they want to know what you're going to do for veterans in that state. They want to know how you're going to help them. They are dealing with a terrible fentanyl crisis, and they want to know how that's going to happen. These are good Americans that are dealing with day-to-day issues, and every state is different. You can't look at them as being swayed because, you know, one person's got this in the polls or one person's got that. They want to see you work. They want to see you earn it. And I So, think so if New Hampshire's governor is in it, that does not discount the importance of New Hampshire. No, I think, I think Chris has been a great governor in New Hampshire, and I think the people of New Hampshire – will respect that and like him for that. But they want to see all options. They're not going to just mindlessly go with one person. They're going to see everybody. Let me let me go to the key domestic issue. And I believe this is key to this election, Governor. I, I, by the way, do you prefer ambassador or governor? I know you say either is better, but which do you prefer? No, I prefer Nikki. Those were moments <laughs> in time. I, I don't do that. No, no, no. When you've got a father-in-law who's a colonel, you never go to the, to the first day. But okay, I'll stick with ambassador. The most important issue in American parenting is going to be school choice. Now, Arizona and your colleague and friend Doug Ducey led the way with the most revolutionary school choices, universal. Utah and Iowa has followed. Arkansas signed it. Uh, It got started in Florida and West Virginia with with programs that were expanding. Ohio is stuck. They're not sure yet. What did you do in South Carolina on the school choice front when you were the governor? So we expanded charter schools in our state, and we pushed for school choice. And at the time, it was very difficult, um, but we did allow for choices. We did help homeschoolers quite a bit. Um, We did also pass a state bill that said any child that can't read by third grade could not go to the fourth grade because we knew that if you can't read by third grade, you're four times less likely to graduate high school. But I'll give you this, Hugh. Think about this. Pre-COVID, 70% of eighth graders in our country were not proficient in reading. 66% of eighth graders were not proficient in math. Now you put closed down schools and COVID and think how far back they are. If ever there was a time to have nationwide school choice, it is now. The number of homeschoolers in our country has multiplied times five. The majority of them are African Americans. They didn't have the luxury of either the money to go to a private school or a waiting list because there were so few private school options. We need to open up the competition. We need to put parents in charge. But more than that, look at what kids are learning. You know, you've heard about critical race theory. Everybody's talked about that. But think about what they're doing with the gender stuff. And you had Florida. Florida, they talked about the don't say gay bill and said, you know, you shouldn't talk about to any child before the third grade about gender. No, that doesn't go far enough. 
when I went to school, you didn't have sex ed until seventh grade. And even then, your parents had to sign a permission slip. And my dad wouldn't sign it. So I was the uncool kid in the classroom next door. Parents need to be teaching their kids this, not schools. You don't need to be talking about gender. You don't need to be talking about race. You need to be teaching them math, science, history, and understand that your job is to create responsible citizens. So is the Doug Ducey model the one that every state should uh, embrace if they've got the votes in the Republican legislature to do so? Look at the Doug Ducey model, but look at the Kim Reynolds model, too. Iowa and Arizona did a fantastic job with school choice, and that is what we should try and get every state to do. I think it would be fantastic. Two more questions, Governor. The uh, biggest criticism leveled by you at you thus far by the pro-Trump wing of the party is that you left early. You didn't stick for four years. What's your answer to that? <laughs> because D.C. thinks that you have to stay in D.C. forever. That's the problem. They think that you like it, that's ridiculous. I mean, if you look at the wall of U.N. ambassadors, the average time any U.N. ambassador stays is two years. In D.C. promotes longevity. D.C. promotes you staying forever because they think that's how you get power. I went in there. I did a job. I did it very well. And then I know that when it's time, you have to allow fresh voices and fresh ideas to get in there. I believe in term limits. I'm always going to do that. I put in eight years of seven hours a day, 24 hours a day of keeping my state and my country safe. And You know, I'm proud of the work I did, and I think the results speak for themselves. Last question has to do with the practicalities of running. Vivek Ramaswamy was on the program this week, and and he's a charming and wonderful, bright guy. Some gaps in his resume, which he'll fill, but he's got a half billion dollars he's going to self-fund. You need small donors. You need big donors. How do you compete against that, Ambassador? You you go and you touch as many hands as you can. You you earn the credit of the American people. You tell them to go to NikkiHaley.com and pitch in. $5, $10, $20 Five, ten, twenty dollars today, and you do it that way. I don't have millions of dollars to put in a campaign account, but I don't want millions of dollars to put in a campaign account. I want to earn American support. I don't want to earn anybody else's support. That's what I'm going for. That's what I'm going to do, and we're going to do it five dollars at a time. Uh, Ambassador Haley, keep coming back. What's the website again? NikkiHaley.com. Join our movement. Let's get back to a strong and proud America. It's time for a new generation and a new direction, and we're going to get there. Keep coming back, Ambassador. Much appreciate your time. Have a good time with Ruthless today. Be be on your guard. They're ruthless. I I will take care of you. Thank you. In the year of our Lord, 2023, I am Hugh Hewitt inside Studio West, where it is not raining. Thank goodness. Stop the ark for a day. I begin with something from Ellis Items. News Items by John Ellis is the very last thing I go on the air reading before the show begins because it's got the very latest news from overnight. This is kind of chilling, the very first item Ellis Items puts up. Xi Jinping, China's most powerful leader since Mao Zedong, is preparing to use the upcoming rubber stamp parliamentary session to launch a forceful overhaul of the government by appointing his most trusted acolytes to oversee the financial technology, and other sectors. The annual National People's Congress, which kicks off Saturday, will replace the premier, the head of government, and his team of technocrats that have been credited with steering the economy through the turmoil of the past five years. Important portfolios, such as the financial sector, may also be restructured. Xi pledged at a meeting on Tuesday that the party was planning for, quote, far-reaching changes, which aside from the financial sector reform would include exerting closer control, I don't know how he gets any closer than Xi, over the technology and science sectors and perhaps ominously for business, increased party involvement in, quote, non-public enterprises. Bankers in China are being told to rectify their mindsets, clean up their hedonistic lifestyles, stop copying Western ways. The directives, part of a 3,500-word commentary last week from the country's top anti-graph watchdog, is just the latest sign that President and General Secretary Xi Jinping campaign to tighten the Communist Party's grip on everything is kicking off. It's a purge. Now, I'm old enough to remember Brezhnev, Gromyko. I'm old enough to remember uh, Andropov, who lasted about six months, and Chernenko, who lasted about six months, and then Gorbachev, and then Yeltsin. Of course, I've been watching Putin every day since that paranoid dictator arrived on the scene. But it's been a long time since anyone went naked, ambition, cold steel, purge in China. Mao used to do it all the time. I mean, wake up and Mao would purge somebody. But we've got a big purge coming in China. So I'm here to tell you, not only don't go to London, 
like Dennis Farina, don't go to London. That's my declaration. Don't go Anything to Chicago. Anything to declare? Yeah. Don't go to England. Yeah, don't go to England. Don't go to Chicago. And it's because of the airport, not because Lori Lightfoot left. That's pretty good. Maybe the new guy will fix the airport. Uh, don't go through Chicago and get out of China and get your money out of China because it's going to be run by the party and it's going back to the 60s. I mean, we could have a cultural revolution. Xi is the real deal. He's a Leninist Marxist. That that from Ellis Items is the first thing, last thing I ring in the morning. Boy, that's bracing. Red sky at morning. Purge victims take warning in red China. Other stories. In an epic battle of tanks, Russia was routed. Again! They had a big tank battle in the southern part of the front line, and Russia threw everything they had at it, and they got blown up again. They're just bad at this. They are very bad. It doesn't mean they don't have 6,500 nuclear weapons. They do. doesn't mean it's in our national interest to leave. It's not. We need to stay there. We need to keep giving them everything they need, and we have to have Zelensky and folks drive Putin back. Don't want an inch of Russian territory. Don't want to threaten Russia in any way. Repulsing invasion is what the West ought to be doing. There is a massive scandal in England, one that would be replicated here if we had the same sort of leak, but our journalism are uncurious about the lockdowns because the lockdowns were plotted by the left because it was government control. They like government control. But they have something called lockdown gate going on in Great Britain. All of the WhatsApp, thousands and thousands of WhatsApp messages among the senior members of the government, including the their Tony Fauci is named Matt Hancock. Uh, and boy, is he getting blasted. Telegraph has reactions of famous names to the lockdown files, they're being called. And across the spectrum, people are shocked. Uh, the member of Parliament DUP for North Antrim wrote, this is massive and I'm abs absolutely delighted. WhatsApp aren't considered open to FOIA requests. Isabel Oakshot, who leaked them, has done the country a tremendous service. Well done, Telegraph, for running it. At last, journalism doing service in the public interest instead of the government's lockdown interest. And it is just, they knew everything. They knew about, they before we knew about it, apparently. Or maybe Fauci just didn't tell anyone. Maybe everybody up and down, the whole public health bureaucracy across the world knew that lockdowns were unnecessary, that we needed to protect seniors and people with underlying conditions, and that children were at no risk at all. They knew that. They knew that. They knew that in Great Britain. And now we're finding it out. Now, Hancock's been fired. And it's not Rishi Sunak's problem. Boris is gone. But boy, it's applicable here. Unionists in Northern Ireland, speaking of Great Britain, face dilemma over accepting new trade deal. Look, DUP, get with the program because it's happening. Uh, all the Brexiteers like it. It's going to happen. The Windsor Accord puts an end to Brexit. Rishi got it done. Boris got it almost there. And Rishi got it over the goal line. Uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu compares the Tel Aviv protesters to settlers who fought, who set the fire in Huwara, uh, sort of the mini pogrom. It's not a pogrom, but it was a riot. But they had a bad day on the on the settler front a couple of days ago, and the PM stepped in it. Michael Warren will be along in this hour to discuss it. The Knesset, the Knesset is just yelling at each other over the judicial reform. We'll talk about that with Orrin as well. Joe Biden is going to use his veto pen today. Um, a few Democrats joined the House majority to ban the ESG rules adopted by the Labor Department. They're, they're crazy. They're stupid. They're awful. Joe Biden's standing by them because he wants to racialize everything and he wants the left to run every corporation. Wall Street Titans are confronting a huge ESG backlash, according to the Financial Times. It's being led by a lot of people. We may talk about that with Nikki Haley, who will be along. Candidate for President Ambassador Nikki Haley, former governor of South Carolina, coming along later in the show. It's been quite the week. Uh, Vivek, uh, Vivek Ramaswamy, uh, Mike Pompeo, yesterday was Chris Christie, today is Nikki Haley. That's four would-be presidential candidates. I'm tired. I'm going on vacation next week. Not really a vacation. I'm going to be chasing Genghis Kate around um, to spell her mom as uh, my son-in-law is deployed a little bit. And not, not a long deployment, just a little bit, so I'm helping out for a week. And General Issimo is going to pilot the plane. Now, there's a mountain out there. It's full of snow. I don't know if he's going to pilot the plane right into the mountain. We'll find out. Um, past performance is no guarantee of future results. But General Issimo will be stepping up, or at least four-fifths of General Issimo. Some Republicans want to ban Latinx, is a headline in the New York Times. Really? I think, I think Latinos want to ban Latinx. And the headline continues in the New York Times. These Latino Democrats agree. You think? Like 95% of Latinos don't like Latinx. They think that's foisted on them by the DEI ESG bureaucracy, and they don't like it. Sarah Huckabee Sanders is banning it. She's going to be a terrific governor. 
Long, robust U.S. market uh, labor market shows signs of cooling, according to the Wall Street Journal. Yeah, that's going to happen because there's a recession on the way because of Joe Biden. The Havana syndrome, likely uncaused, is not is unlikely caused by foreign adversary or weapon. That stuns a lot of people. A lot of people thought Havana syndrome was the Russians or the Chinese, but it turns out our government can't conclude that. This this headline is something. Republicans seize on train derailment to go after Buttigieg in the Washington Post. Really? People of East Palestine, Western Pennsylvania, north up to Trumbull County, down to Columbus. It's not you're not the victims. You're not the Pete Buttigieg. Poor Pete Buttigieg is the victim because Republicans are being mean to him. Eli Lilly is going to cut the price of its insulin drugs by 70% cap patient costs at $35 per dose. In Chicago, choice points to a Democratic divide the GOP hopes to exploit. That, you know, how can you cover this? They're both Democrats. Villar and the other guy, they're both Democrats. Brandon... And one of them is a, a radical left Democrat, Brandon, and, and Villar is a moderate Democrat, but they're both Democrats. It's like Seth Moulton running against John Kerry for something, young and old, left and right. It's just, it's a Democratic primary. Uh, don't get the Republicans involved. Kellyanne Conway meets with prosecutors as the Trump inquiry escalates in New York. This came out of the New York Times this morning. The Manhattan District Attorney's Office summoned Kellyanne Conway on Wednesday. It's the Stormy Daniels payoff hush money scandal. And uh, Chris Christie said yesterday, not quite a lot of news, that he expected that indictment to drop ahead of any out of Georgia or Jack Smith. I think he may have been prescient. A big splash, the Financial Times says. Ron DeSantis gears up for expected 2024 run against um, Trump. We shall see. Welcome back, America. That music means the Admiral is in the house. Admiral James Stavridis, retired United States Navy, joins me. Good morning, Admiral. Glad you could make it this morning. Lots of headlines from Ukraine I want to talk with you about. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm down in uh, Miami and South Florida on a little bit of business, but it's uh, where I was born, so always good to be in the magic city. I'm glad that you were there. Admiral, the front page, New York Times, an epic battle of tanks. Russia was routed, repeating earlier mistake. It happened again. Uh, and the the Ukrainians, are, are they're, they've got tanks in the field. They're beating them tank to tank, but they're also beating them with anti-tank missiles. What lessons do you think the American military are taking away from this inability of Russia to move a front forward with armor? Well, it is good to see our Ukrainian partners, allies, and friends really take it to the Russians yet again. Um, three big takeaways for me. One, uh, the Russian military simply does not appear to be a learning organism. You would have thought, after watching this movie a year ago, as they tried and failed around Kiev, around Kharkiv, and all their objectives, uh, you would think they would have learned to uh, to do the kinds of things that are second nature to our tankers. Um, you, you just can't drive tanks blithely onto a battlefield and expect um, you're not going to get the kind of ambushes that the Ukrainians set up. Takeaway number two, uh, training matters. Uh, the Ukrainians have been trained and are uh, much more uh, adept at operating in combined arms ways, bringing that special forces ambush alongside the main battle tank, alongside infantry unit, alongside the high-tech drone. So the training that the Ukrainians have gotten matters. And then third, finally, as always, you uh, will, morale. Uh, the Ukrainians are, are fighting for their lives, for their cities, for their children. The Russians are a bunch of conscripts uh, for the most part at this point and are simply not motivated. So I think those are the three big takeaways. Now, history tells us, Admiral, and I know you know this, that Mother Russia can absorb a lot of punishment and rebound. Yep. People should not count the Russians out. And therefore, the question becomes, what is acceptable? I see the Russian fleet is expanding in the Black Sea. The immediate threat, of course, are sea-based missiles. Do the Ukrainians, in your view, have the ability to strike at those ships beyond their surprise attack on the, the big ship early in the war? I don't think they do, um, simply because the Russians, from all the intel that I'm observing, are operating at significant distance off the coasts. And so the Ukrainians at this point don't have the highly sophisticated, long-range uh, 
cruise missiles that could attack those ships. Um, they snuck one in on the Moskva, and, and it was a major triumph. I mean, this was the flagship of the Black Sea, went straight to the bottom with probably 500 highly trained Russian sailors on board. The Russians here learned a lesson and are operating much further out to sea. But I think this is an area where we could provide more assistance. We could provide harpoon-like cruise missiles, uh, help the Ukrainians understand how to hook those together with drones for targeting and, and, and conduct attacks on the Black Sea fleet. The Ukrainians could conduct those attacks. I think that would be a significant smart move uh, for us to invest in because that would also send signals back to Mother Russia. Um, ships going down have a, a pretty dramatic quality, and, and it's, it's not like uh, uh, 10 or 15 people getting killed in a, in, a, in a battle per week when 500 go down at once. That's a big incident, so I think that would be a good investment in an anti-ship uh, cruise missile kind of package for our Ukrainian colleagues. Oh my gosh, it's been more than 40 years, Admiral. You were probably a, a plebe. I don't know if you were in the in the active duty yet when Argentina invaded the oh, Falklands, yeah. and the Exocet missile that they fired and took down a major British uh, it wasn't a carrier, I'm not sure what it was, a big ship, was a shockwave through the United Kingdom and through the world. Uh, does Ukraine have anything like that right now? No, they do not. And, and by the way, taking a look at that battle, the Battle of the Falklands, is worth doing as you think about a Black Sea kind of war at sea scenario, um, because it was really land forces, the Argentines, the Brits knocked their ships out, you know, day five, using nuclear submarines, by the way. Uh, but it was the Argentines from land attacking the British at sea. And as the Duke of Wellington said about Waterloo for the Brits, it was a near-run thing. And it wasn't just one ship. The British lost at least half a dozen ships sunk during that uh, war, Exocet cruise missiles primarily. So a lot of lessons there. It makes sense to make that kind of investment for all the reasons we've talked about. Now, Admiral, I want to change. Vivek Ramaswamy is a very smart guy, biotech entrepreneur, Harvard grad, Yale Law. He's made a half billion dollars in the private sector, kind of guy you run into at the Carlisle Group all the time. He's 37 years old. He's running for president. And he's asked for some help from me um, about prepping on you know, media asking quite because he didn't know what the nuclear triad was. And I began to think that Donald Trump had being confused about the triad eight years ago may have been uh, a false positive. Generally, people old enough to remember the Cold War understand our land, sea and air based nuclear deterrent. But I'm wondering if there's a generational issue here. Have you run across people who did not grow up in the Cold War not understanding MAD doctrine and triad and and the necessity of deterring nuclear war. Oh, absolutely. And I think I think really the watershed is in fact the end of the Cold War, which happens, you know, in and around 1990. So that's getting 30 years ago. And uh, people before that point in time were deep into this and and a big reason to is because of popular culture. Uh, people were watching movies like The Hunt for Red October. They were reading books like The Third World War by Sir John Hackett. Um, they had seen the classic Cold War films, the, uh, On the Beach and uh, all the others, Dr. Strangelove being the most iconic of them. So there was a, a lot of popular education that was occurring, and also it was more consistently studied in our schools and colleges. Cold War comes along, and as my old boss, Bob Gates, best boss ever, uh, has said, we took a vacation from history, um, and we, we stopped worrying about the nuclear challenges, frankly. Well, that vacation from history is over as this era of great power competition comes back. And yes, our leaders need to be well-steeped in the ideas of strategy at that nuclear level, because still a very low chance of it occurring, but we're in an increasingly dangerous scenario. Our leaders need to understand everything from the triad to mutual assured destruction to theories of how we 
conduct deterrence back and forth in these scenarios. Now, we are also of the generation where Time Magazine or Newsweek or U.S. News and World Report was a weekly must read for kids who were interested. And, and actually, high schools got free subscription. And they always would run the side by side comparison of the U.S. and the USSR tanks, submarines, airplanes, all the kind of, and they would talk about missiles and they would have the graphics. You could not avoid it. First, there is no common news culture. And second, they don't cover. I, I, I don't know myself how many warheads China has. I, you know, I just don't know. And it used to be at my family. You know, Soviet Union had 6,500. I know that. I know what we've got. And I just, I wonder if really it's on the news business to join the effort to make the public smart. It, it absolutely is. China, by the way, has about uh, 10% in terms of warheads uh, compared to us. Um, and you get into here some technicalities about deployable warheads and uh, strategic arms limitation talks, et cetera. Point being, however, that, yes, the media have an obligation to cover this. And, and going back to China for a minute, you, as, as you're well aware, China is in the process of upgrading that nuclear arsenal significantly. I think they intend to triple it over the next five years or so. Um, they are building more intercontinental ballistic missile sites. They're upgrading their uh, SSBN fleet. Um, they are on the march in that area as they are in so many others. And, yeah, I think it's time that that get more coverage. And you have to start with uh, leaders uh, who want to run for office, talking about it, being knowledgeable about it. It, it really is, uh, again, that vacation from history, from, from not worrying about that end of the spectrum, that's over. Now, part of the effort, and I mean this, I'm not shining you on, 2034 is part of the effort to educate people, your novel yes. about a war in the future. I also look at television shows like The Americans, which help, you know, I teach my law students, go watch that, you'll get an idea of what we're dealing with with Chinese espionage. But now the new Slow Horses show with Gary Oldham on Apple Plus, I don't know if you've seen that yet, Admiral, but it's, it's bringing back Cold War themes about espionage that used to be in the water, right? We read Le Carre, we read Tinker Taylor's Soldier Spy, we read, uh, you know, Game Set Match. We read that, oh, that was popular culture. And I think the Chinese are harder for us to put into popular culture. That's absolutely right. And for starters, culturally, we are much more different in comparison to China than we are to a effectively European nation like Russia. And again, we also have that long, long path of Cold War espionage back and forth. By the way, Luc Carre's perfect book is called A Perfect Spy. It oh, really yes. is the best of his books. Oh, you think uh, so? He, That's interesting. I, I do. I, I think he wrote 20 of them. I have uh, six signed first editions. I have all 20 of them in hardcover. I'm an enormous fan of John Le Carre. And Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy is a brilliant book. I would put A Perfect Spy at the top of the list. Just oh, the complexities of the themes are astounding. Point being, China, we don't have that kind of history. We have utterly different culture, uh, a completely different mindset. China tends to, to lead with the commercial espionage. Russia leads with the security espionage. So big differences, and we need to be attuned to those as the great power competition between the U.S. and China really starts heating up. And I'm sure you tuned in for the hearings uh, yesterday. Yes. Uh, really remarkable uh, to listen to real experts like my good friend H.R. McMaster uh, and Matt Pottinger, uh, a true China hand, uh, talking about this great power competition and how serious it is. I yeah. encourage folks to pull that transcript, by the way. Not only pull the transcript, I, I got to talk to Gallagher about putting yes. up a podcast of the entire thing, because I think yes. people would listen to all three hours if they could find it easily, if there's a podcast of the select committee. Admiral Stav, I always appreciate your showing up this morning, especially. Thank you. Follow him on Twitter, Stav Ritas J. He really cannot not listen to Admiral Stav. And go get 2034. Give it to all your friends. That's really the best single volume book of fiction that helps the average American get ready for what's ahead. Stay tuned. I'm Hugh Hewitt. Senator Jim Talent is retired from the United States Senate, still active in all matters, national security and good governance from the Bipartisan Policy Center in Washington, D.C. Good morning, Jim. How are you? I'm fine, you. And Let's I am a non-presidential candidate on your show. 
and always have. There you go, but you, you comment on them. So I was talking with Admiral Stav about uh, Mr. Ramaswamy not knowing what the nuclear triad is. I'm not down on him. I'm just thinking it's a generational issue. If you grow up in the world of the Cold War, you, you see movies, you read books, you can't avoid Time Magazine, you know what mutual assured destruction is, and you know what nuclear strategy is. I just don't think people do anymore if they are you know grew up after the Cold War. What do you think? No, I agree with that. I mean, I think if, if this had been 25 years ago, a well-read person in his position would at least know what it is. I mean, he might not be able to tell you exactly what it entails or why we have all three legs of the triad, but he'd know what it is. And he didn't, I mean, he didn't recognize the term. So, yeah. And he was humble about to... it. I love that. He said, teach us. Yeah. I, I'm going to find, uh, get me brief. I'm, you know, I'm going to send him to you as one of the people he ought to talk to to get a briefing and Jerry Hendricks, et cetera. Because, I mean, you give time to candidates who want to get smart, don't you? Oh, all the time. All the time. Particularly on defense issues. But I will say this, you, and this is more your area than mine. His comms people slipped up because they should have said to him, look, you're going on the you, you at Joe. So there are some things you need to read up a little bit about. You're going to get some questions about foreign policy and national security policy, and they clearly didn't. I'll tell and you Alger Hiss I, and the Looming Tower. Yeah, they didn't, Eric, they didn't do a good job. When, when Eric Schmidt was running for the Senate, uh, his comms guy called me and said, he's going on you, you it. And I said, he better read a few things. I gave him some questions. <laughs> well, he was good. He was very well prepared. Senator, yeah, now let's turn to the, to the China hearing that was Tuesday night. It's a great start. Yeah. Did you see it? Yeah. What did you think about it? How do they improve on their game? Well, they explored all different parts of the threat that China presents. And this is one thing that Mike Gallagher understands. You have to explain the why. Right up front, you have to explain why this matters, okay? Because if the Chinese achieve their foreign policy goals, they are going to exercise the power of a sovereign in the Western Pacific and then beyond. So they're going to tell us, you want to trade with Vietnam? You got to pay us in order to be able to do it. You want to sail your ships in the South China Sea? You got to do what we want us, what we want you to do. Uh, you're criticizing what we're doing in Xinjiang Province. We're going to slap tariffs on you, and if you come back, we're going to punish you. You can't have your alliance with Japan. They want to replace the world order with one where they're at the top, and we are one of their vassals. And I think he went through that in a lot of different areas. And I agree with what he said. I thought the Democrats were very constructive. And they, he has some really good people in there. Seth Moulton. I mean, I've known for a long time. And so it's a good committee. They're going to do great work. When he got a Democrat congressman to go with him to New York to the secret Chinese Communist Party police station, and that guy's a progressive lefty, that shows yeah. me that this committee might actually do what committees like the Kefauver Committee and the Church Committee did and indeed the Watergate committee bipartisan good faith effort to get to the bottom of the threat. Yeah, there's a very strong bipartisan coalition in the Congress that understands the danger China China presents. They emphasize different aspects. You notice he mentioned the Democrats talk mostly about the economic aspect of this. The Republicans were more on the security. And you know, you I think one of the reasons I, I encountered this a couple of years ago when I testified before the Senate. There's a lot of, of members and senators who stuck their necks out year after year after year in order to support policies like letting China into the World Trade Organization. And they did it because the Chinese made commitments and, and the Chinese talked a lot about liberalizing. And then they pulled the rug out from under everybody. So I think there's a lot of people who are not going to let them play, uh, you know, uh, 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 Charlie Brown in the football and Lucy in the football and Charlie Brown again. Now, I Senator Talent, I was just, I, I was just I talking with missed. Admiral Stav about Russia yeah. and uh, the fact that they've lost another tank battle. So we've got a minute yeah. for you to tell us how this is going to end. Well, you know, my anticipation was that the most likely result this year would be a battlefield that was pretty stalemated because the Russians have had prepared defenses in depth and they had a, 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 a commander who was good at that. And then Putin replaced him in January with Gerasimov, who is more offensive minded. So it's clear that he made promises to Putin. Listen, I can, you know, I can, I can retake territory uh, in the Donbass. And I think they're trying to do it because it's Putin's priority, but they, they can't do maneuver warfare. They couldn't at the beginning of the war when they had trained troops, when they had enough kit, you know, when, when their morale was at least not where it is now, 
And you and stab is exactly even I know you can't send armor out by itself. It's it's liable to counterattack by infantry people, infantrymen with stinger missiles. And yeah. that's exactly what happened. So I think he's right. It's 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 evidence they haven't learned to this point. Not yet. They're not a learning machine, unlike China, which is, and Xi Jinping. Jim Talent on Twitter with the Bipartisan Policy Center. Always good to see you, Senator. Thank you for joining me. I begin this hour, though, with an old friend, Undersecretary of State Keith Kroc in the Trump administration, led the effort to bring accountability to the Chinese Communist Party's theft, theft of our intellectual property to get clean technology. He joins me from Washington this morning. Good morning, Mr. Secretary. Great to have you back. Oh, Hugh, it's always a pleasure. Great to see you. Now, tell me first, how goes the effort at Purdue? I know you're pouring your, your lifeblood into making Purdue a not just an engineering great school, but now a national security great school. Yeah, you know, I think now uh, Purdue is recognized as the top national security university in the United States, other than I would say the, the military academies. Uh, and there's so much going on. And I think one of the things that really sticks out is they're on the cutting edge of, of technology research for all the national security uh, tech sectors. And that's why we formed the Kroc Institute for Tech Diplomacy uh, at Purdue. It's a, it's a great breakthrough. Tell me what you would like to see them drive home to their undergraduates and graduates about China, building off of the big hearing that Mike Gallagher chaired on the Select Committee on the Chinese Communist Party on Tuesday night. Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt about it. It's about developing that next generation of transformational leaders of tomorrow. And to understand that, look, in order to secure our freedom, we have to secure our, our technology. And technology... Uh, must advance freedom because they could be used for uh, good purposes or bad purposes. And that's one of the reasons why, Q, yesterday we launched the Global Tech Security Commission. Uh, and this is uh, backed by Congress. We announced uh, 10 honorary co-chairs, uh, five Democrats, five Republicans from Congress. It really, they're the top foreign policy uh, uh, lawmakers. Uh, and this this effort uh, is all about creating a global tech security strategy for the free world. We've got uh, f 15 uh, country commissioners, 12 tech commissioners, and 20 strategy commissioners. And each one of those has probably between six to 10 advisory council members. So this is a big effort. Well, tell me, who, how is that going to operate? Where is it going to be located? How often will it get together? Will they work in hand in hand with the Gallagher Committee, which I think is so important to educating America? How's the commission going to work? Yeah, by the way, this this is a, a, a result of a direct request. And uh, we'll be testifying uh, for the China Select uh, Committee. I just talked with uh, Mike on Monday. That's why we made the, the announcement uh, yesterday. We held a big uh, re reception in the Capitol for this. So it is uh, it's hand in hand because. You know, it is long overdue that we have a national conversation about the most urgent threat uh, to the free world, and that's the Chinese Communist Party. So the timing couldn't be uh, more perfect. Secretary Kroc, I don't know if you read Ellis items every morning. It's the last thing I read before I go on the air. And the first thing this morning is that Xi is about to purge a whole group of people in China to take over the tech sector and the finance sector in ways you know, he's already omnipresent, but now it's going to be Maoist. He's going to act. What do you make of that? And will he screw it up or will he make it better? Well, he's going to take total control over this. And this is what, and this is one of the reasons, Hugh, why, why, you know, a number of months ago, I penned an article in Fortune magazine that was titled Present Your China Contingency Plan at the Next Board Meeting. So now I'm seeing some of the most respected board members in America demanding from their C CEO a China contingency plan. Because if you think about what is a board member's responsibility, it is all about mitigating risk for their shareholders. And so one of the things at the Kroc Institute, we've been getting a lot of requests. Uh, hey, what does the China contingency plan look like? Can you provide us a checklist? And we're just about ready to put that out. This is critical for corporations. Uh, Under Secretary Kroc, you just made me think of ESG and DEI. Because Joe Biden is going to veto the ESG bill this morning. 
if ESG actually looked at Chinese human rights violation, if DEI actually encouraged ideological diversity and brought in people aware of the communist threat, I'd be all in favor of it. But you're a corporate veteran and you're a State Department veteran and you know about the, the threat from the Chinese Communist Party. What do you yeah. make about ESG and DEI in America? Well, I can tell you, uh, ESG, by the way, we just put out uh, a case study on ESG and the solar. It, it, it's been taught a couple of times at, at Wharton. And what it lays out for the students is, you know, there's probably three reasons why there should be no Chinese company uh, in ESG. And, and, and it's because of E, S and G, because E is environmental. And these guys are the biggest polluters in the world. They make their solar panels with the two biggest uh, coal fired power plants in the world. S, that's that that's social. So that stands for human rights. They are shipping slave labor all over China. Uh, you know, they're committing genocide. And then G, governance, the most important issue there are fiduciary responsibilities. Now, if, if, none of these companies are transparent and you can't audit their books. For the, for, so for those three reasons, there should be no companies in ESG. And, and, and you know, it, it lets the students kind of... No Chinese companies. If any co if no an American Chinese. company embraces ESG, yeah. they should have no investments in China, period, right? Yeah, and, and there should be no, you know, in all these, uh, uh, you know, 431 BlackRock emerging uh, market funds where the Chinese uh, companies are sprinkled in everywhere and they use the MSCI index, and... All these guys claim that, you know, these are ESG funds. These are ESG companies. So no Chinese companies and no funds with these Chinese companies should be considered ESG. It's just absolutely hypocritical. Yeah, I, I don't think you can stress this enough. And I didn't know you had a Wharton case. I hope they take it up at HBS, at Chicago, all the other great business schools. How yeah. long did it take to develop that? How's it being received by our woke generation of MBA students? Do they realize... ESG is incompatible with CCP. By the way, I'll tell you, it was really it was really enlightening for these students. Uh, and, and I just met with the dean of Georgetown uh, Law School on Monday. We're probably going to teach it there. We've taught other cases at Harvard and Stanford along those lines. We taught the Clean Network case. We taught the, uh, the Chips and Science Act case at Stanford. So, um, yeah, no, I think that I think the students, um, you know, they are they are open. And and I think they understand, uh, particularly with Putin's bloody invasion of the Ukraine, they could see that, look, you have to fight for freedom and you ha and freedom is worth fighting for. And sometimes you have to put your line, your life on the line for it. And I think th these guys are really smart and they can see the tie in between China and Russia, the totalitarian uh, twins. So I think uh, this generation coming up. I've got a lot of confidence in it. You know, you call it the totalitarian twins, uh, Secretary Kroc. I refer to the new axis of evil because I don't I think China runs Iran and Russia as proxy states it, it, as uh, sort of. And so what do we do about the? How do you educate a new generation of Americans who are just not up to speed on what superpower competition means? Well, you know, the first thing I think every they got to understand is superpower advantage is not static and we have to fight every day uh in terms of national security right uh, you you and i we grew up in ohio to white picket fence you know the dog 2.5 children i was 0.5 because i had two sisters uh, you know it, it it it's we have to fight every day to preserve this 250 year old experiment because it goes against all the laws of physics because the natural order thinks is the bad king the dictator and the emperor and uh, and technology is now the battleground because our rivals are are playing a four dimensional game of military, economic, diplomatic and cultural chess. And a crossroads of that is technology. That's the battleground. And they have little respect for rule of law, sovereignty of nations, uh, the environment, human rights, uh, all these things that protect our, our freedoms. And so you've got to do something about it. And. And I think that's what the China Select Committee is about. That's what the commission's about. That's what the Last Institute question, is. Mr. Secretary. You are a member of the board world. You know Silicon Valley. Have they woken up to China? Well, you know, it's interesting you ask that. I hosted 36 
of the top CEOs of my home a few years ago when I was undersecretary. And I had him, I had him go around the room and uh, talk about China. It was a safe environment. And they're China horror stories. And I can tell you, it was cathartic, it was enlightening, and it was frightening at the same time. And at the end of the night, you could probably divide the CEOs into three categories. One is, hey, they've been burned over there. They're not going back. You know, they go in with full body armor if they have to do business there. The, you know, there's another uh, uh, group that they're just cha-chinging it, just making money. But the, probably the huh? biggest group was, oh, you know, that happened to you? Yeah, tell me more. So Keep growing guys- that, Secretary Kroc. It is always great to see you, Keith Kroc. Keep coming back. Keep sounding the alarm. Stay tuned, America. I'll be right back on The Hugh Hewitt Show.